I went out to dinner with a friend. I ordered a glass of wine. When the glass of wine was delivered to the table, I looked at it and I actually recoiled from it, didn't touch it, couldn't believe I didn't drink it, got in the cab to go home that night, got on my knees in the back of the cab and said, God, if this is my moment, please let me know somehow. God, I hope this is my moment. And it was, it was that moment of grace. I dreamt that you were twisted. So today on the Soberful Podcast, we are welcoming the very, very fabulous Laurie Do. Welcome, Laurie. Welcome, Veronica. And you're fabulous too. Thank you. <laughs> so you may have heard uh, Laurie and you certainly may recognize her if you've been watching TV in the last 25 years. Laurie is a an award-winning national news anchor and she has hosted shows on all three major cable news networks, CNN, MSB, MSNBC and Fox News. She um, has done reporting of lots of different uh, areas uh, globally that's happened in the last, all the stuff that's happened in the last 25 years. She, how long have you been in recovery, Laurie? I will have 16 years of continuous recovery in March of 2023. Wonderful. And congratulations. And, and has worked, and, and, and now a lot of your work is in that area. Laurie is the chief brand officer at recoveryeducation.com, which is one of the things we're going to be talking about today, because this interview, I've wanted to get Laurie on for a while just because she's great and has a fabulous story, but particularly now she's involved with recovery education, because this today's episode is going to be part of our um, series of interviews on parenting as prevention, and we're going to find out more about that in a little while, but before I'd love for people to tell a little bit about your story. How on earth did you manage to have an alcohol problem and be on your game reading the news? I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a trick when you think about it, uh, really. Uh, I want to start off by saying I was never drunk on the air, but I was deeply hungover many, many days and, and months during my mm -hmm. career as a news anchor. Mm -hmm. Um, so look, how did I manage it? Yeah, it's, it's quite a feat. You know, you think about when you are living in active addiction, you know what mm -hmm. that's like. I certainly know what that's like. So do millions of other people. It is hard enough to get out of bed in the morning, uh, much less be on national television every day. So, you know, sometimes I think, wow, I really, I really accomplished something there, uh, being, being a raging alcoholic and coke addict and, um, <laughs> Anchoring the news, uh, again, not while I was drunk and high, but, um, you know, this is an insidious disease, Veronica, as you know, it doesn't care if you're a news anchor, it doesn't care if you're president of the United States, it, it doesn't care who you are, where you came from, how old you are, who your daddy is, what your socioeconomic level is, it doesn't care. So, you know, my addiction did not happen overnight. It mm -hmm. was cultivated probably from birth because we know it is a family disease. Uh, I have it on both sides of my family, my mother's side and my father's side. And then, you know, that developed in, it started really in college and sort of went from there until I got sober at the age of 38. So I, I know you have a very interesting story about when you met one of our former presidents. Oh, it's interesting. All right. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, I, looking back on it, it's entertaining and humiliating. But yes, when President George W. Bush was president, uh, Bush 43, I was invited to a private reception to meet President and Mrs. Bush just prior to the White House Correspondents' Dinner in Washington, D.C. Now, you didn't think I was going to be sober for that, did you? Uh, <laughs> no, I proceeded to do shots of vodka alone in my hotel room and blew a couple of lines of cocaine because I surely was not going to meet the president sober. Why would I do that? So, yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> you know, I'm oh, laughing my... about it now, Veronica, because it's so utterly absurd. But it just goes to show you that I couldn't even stay sober to meet the president the leader of the free world. That's how deep this disease goes. You would think that, well, we, well, you know, you what would, were you thinking? What was going through? Your I mind? wasn't thinking. I was thinking I ain't going to be sober when I meet the president. I mean, Veronica, I drank before everything except being on the news. Let me make that clear again. Yeah. yeah. But I really didn't leave my house without drinking. And, you know, of course, the way we look at alcohol and drugs is, well, this is going to um, somehow make me more interesting. 
It's going to make me more clever. It's somehow going to enhance the conversation that I get to have with the president. If I'm drunk and, oh yeah, let, let me do a little cocaine before I meet him too. So looking back on it now, it's absurd. I'm not ashamed, however, because I was in the depths of my disease when this happened. Yeah, And so it's illustrative of the fact that this is a very yeah. confounding disease when when everything else and everyone else is saying, don't do this, you do it anyway, because you have a disease. And it is very much a disease. It's been characterized as such, you know, for 70 something years now. And, and that's something that a lot of people don't understand. They think it's a choice, but it's not. So how did that go then when you met President Bush? <laughs> Well, do I remember? Um, yes, I remember waiting in the short line to step up to shake hands and get a photo with President Bush and then Mrs. Bush. And of course, I was trying to think of something interesting to say. And uh, because I'd had a couple of stiff drinks in my room, then in the reception, plus the cocaine, I was very jittery and nervous. And when the moment came for me to meet him, he disarmed me by saying, well, hi there, Laurie. He knew my name. He knew who he was. He said, I really enjoy watching you. And all I could think was, oh my gosh, the president of the United States knows my name, knows who I am, and I do not know what to say. So I think I just thanked him and said, it is such a pleasure to meet you. And then we turned to the camera because you get your photo with the president while you're shaking hands. Let me tell you, Veronica, that picture was so bad of me that I've never shown it to anybody. And uh, I remember when my mother saw the picture, she didn't know how wasted I was. She said, oh, well, I can't put that in the living room. It, you know, it was just, again, wow. yeah. an example of how insane things get. You know, and yeah. I, if I had the chance to meet President Bush again, I would say, thank you for your recovery. Thank you yeah. for being a beacon. You know, whether you agree yeah. with his politics or not, it doesn't matter. Sure. He's an extremely yeah. high profile person who has yeah. been really honest about his recovery. So little did I know that one day I was going to join his club. So if I ever get to meet him again, I would thank him um, for, for setting an example. Wow, that's quite a story. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like your, you know, how your rock bottom and how you got sober and what life's been like? And then we can talk about what you're doing now. Yeah, sure. How did I get sober? Well, I finally asked for help. That's what happened. I mm. knew, Veronica, that I was dying. You know, I mm. was uh, almost 38 years old and holding down a very high profile TV news career, but inside I was dying. And physically, because I was drinking so much and abusing cocaine, I just wasn't very healthy. And I got into a series of drunken arguments with friends, with family members that were humiliating. And I just knew that if I kept up at the pace I was going, I wasn't going to make it. But I was too scared to do anything about it because honestly, I don't know if you felt this way, Veronica, but I honestly did not think I could live without the alcohol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, it never occurred to me. So I never tried to stop. So mm -hmm. when I started feeling rotten physically and rotten emotionally and felt like I was completely spiritually bankrupt, didn't matter that I was on TV every day and looked great inside. I was dying. And I, I just thought, you know, if I keep doing this, I'm going to do some bad cocaine one day, or I'm going to drink too much one night and not wake up. And so for me, that was finally the moment when I asked for help and I hired an addiction doctor in New York city there are great addiction doctors everywhere, but I hired an addiction psychiatrist to help me because I knew I couldn't do it alone. So we had a series of conversations for about six weeks, and then I finally pulled the trigger, as it were, and he, sa he said, you can do this, Laurie. He, I think he was the first person who said, you can live without substances. So we kind of got to that place six or eight weeks later where I was ready to give it up. And my moment of grace happened on March 14th, 2007. I went out to dinner with a friend. I ordered a glass of wine. When the glass of wine was delivered to the table, I looked at it and I actually recoiled from it, as they talk about in some of our literature. I recoiled from the drink, didn't touch it, couldn't believe I didn't drink it, got in the cab to go home that night, got on my knees in the back of the cab and said, God, if if this is my moment, please let me know somehow. God, I hope this is my moment. And it was. It was that moment of grace. 
and I've never looked back. And how's it been the last 16 years or so? <laughs> well, you know what continuous sobriety is like. It's up and down. It's great and it's terrible. It's frustrating. It's invigorating. It's inspiring. It's hard. It's life. You know, re- recovery is multifaceted. There have been great years in recovery and there have been crappy years in recovery. You you know, mm-hmm. sobriety isn't perfect. Recovery isn't perfect, just like life isn't perfect. But I would much rather live this way, facing the pain, facing yeah. the tough things, than drinking Mm -hmm. over them or using drugs over them. So look, Mm -hmm. I take it a day at a time as we all do. I still go to 12 step meetings, which are important to Mm -hmm. me. AA Mm -hmm. saved my life many years ago and it continues to Mm -hmm. be a huge, um, a huge inspiration for me. And I don't do it alone. You know, I surround myself with people who are sober and my best friends who are not in recovery. They don't have to be. They're normie people, which I don't understand. I don't know about you, but I don't understand (laughs) normal drinkers. Um, But my friends who are not in recovery are really proud of me and they want to see me keep going with this just as my my family does. So it, it takes a lot of people to do this. We don't recover alone. Yeah, that's the most important message. Um, Can I ask you, so after you got sober, and you remained as a, a news anchor. How, how many years did you remain? And, and did your did people notice a difference in you and your performance and stuff? That's a great question. Yes. And I just wrote an op-ed for USA Today about the Sober Curious movement. And in my op-ed, mm-hmm. I discussed what those early changes were like when I first got sober, because I got sober on national television. People were watching. They didn't know they were watching me get sober, Veronica, but they <laughs> but they were. So I would say within a couple of weeks, I started sleeping better. Uh, the poison was draining out of my body. It took about two weeks for me to detox, and it was absolutely awful. Um, I was in so much physical pain, but I did it with the help of my doctor. And, you know, I would, I would come into the, the network every day sh- shaking and sweaty, and detoxing and they would do the best they could with me in the hair and makeup room. And then I would just sort of grit my teeth and do my job. But I'll tell you, um, within a month or so, people said, you kind of look different. And then six months later, after I started sleeping better, eating better, exercising more, becoming a more present person for my own life, people asked me if I'd had my face done like had plastic surgery. I was 38. You know, I was like, no, I haven't had any work done. They said, okay, is your hair blonder? No, my hair isn't blonder. Oh, did you lose weight? No, I didn't. You know, what I didn't share at the time was that I was getting sober. So Mm -hmm. my physical appearance changed. My voice changed. It became stronger as I was delivering the news. I literally looked like a different person on air. So most people don't recover in public. Um, I did. And it was it was kind of a miraculous thing. And in addition to being probably a more effective news anchor and and certainly feeling physically and emotionally better, I was a lot easier to work with. I was a better colleague because I wasn't hung over oh. several mornings a week. You know, I thank you for saying that because I say that to all my clients in about six months, people are going to start saying that to you like, what? like you look because it's it's astounding how much better we look when we're not ingesting alcohol. It's quite incredible. And that's all we do. You know, it's not a fancy face cream or anything. I mean, now, all these years later, I need those fancy face creams. I need that Botox. (laughs) But, you know, um, yeah, at the time, it wasn't anything special other than getting sober. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to picture, because I I had the worst hangovers and I had like jobs, like waitressing, and, and it was awful. I cannot imagine being on live television and having to be like this, Yeah, you know, breaking news happens, all that kind of stuff, having to be like intellectually like boom, 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 boom. I can't even, that just sounds like the worst kind of torture ever invented. Yeah, but, but I wasn't this at work. I mean, that's the thing I think about, gosh. How much longer could my TV career have lasted? How much more could, I mean, I accomplished a lot, but imagine what I could have accomplished had I not been hungover or, or nervous and, and, you know, 
lacking confidence at work. You know, I faked a lot of my way through it. Um, again, I never drank on air. Uh, but certainly there weren't, I wasn't always peppy, especially if I had to work the next morning. So it really is kind of absurd when you think about how much I loved my career, how hard I worked to become a news anchor at a very young age on the national level. It was everything I'd ever dreamed of. And then mm. what did I do? I chipped away at that dream every single day mm. for many, many years. Mm. And so I look back with some regret. But mm. then I also look at the gratitude piece of this and think, mm. my life is completely different because I'm sober. It's 100% mm. better because, I mean, a thousand percent better because I'm sober. And actually now I'm doing something that I really love. Not that I didn't love doing the news and reporting from the Middle East during the war on terror and getting to interview world leaders. And, you know, it was very, very exciting. But now what I do, what you do, helping mm -hmm. people, trying to save lives, helping families, helping people find what we have found is worth so much more. And and so you've been an amazing recovery advocate. It, it means a lot when people in the public eye come out and tell those stories. Yeah. And um, I know you've done a lot in, in the time that you've been sober, but I know your real passion now is uh, real and recovery education. And that's what I want to talk about because I, I passionately believe parenting is prevention and that we need to provide a hell of a lot more support to parents. So t tell us about it and tell us how you got involved. Yes, I will. So it's recoveryeducation.com. And anyone who's listening or watching today um, who is a parent or a concerned other of a teenager or an adolescent uh, who might need help, please join us, recoveryeducation.com. I'll put on my real hat, literally. <laughs> put on a hat. Uh, recovery education and applied learning, but again, it's recoveryeducation.com. And as you say, parenting isn't easy. We both have kids. Um, mine's, mine's almost 25. You have younger kids, but you know, you, you have to, you have to communicate with them from day one. Uh, particularly when it comes to substance use issues. And that was something that we found lacking. Um, those of us who decided to start this company and begin this platform was that there are a lot of resources out there for young people, adolescents and adults in recovery, but not so much for the families. And You know, Veronica, we know that addiction is a family disease and it needs to be treated as such. There has to be a connection within the family to help the kids involved. And one of our roles, um, you know, as parents is to communicate openly with our kids about a whole host of issues, really everything. It's up to us to do it. You mentioned prevention, and that is so important. You know, people often ask me, is addiction really preventable? And, you know, part of me thinks, well, not really. I mean, I look at myself and I think I had the genetic component and then the environmental stuff added to it. I don't know if anything could have prevented me. But no one talked to me when I was 10 years old about the dangers of drinking. Nobody told me when I was growing up that I had addiction on both sides of my family and that this could be something real that would affect me. And it did. Didn't affect my sister. She's a normie, but it affected me. And the very first lesson on our educational platform is prevention. So mm. we talk about setting expectations of your child early on. We also talk about the importance of speaking with your kids honestly about it, speak to them early and often. And I know you have been doing that with your kids probably since they were old mm -hmm. enough to understand. Yeah. And that's what I did too. And I'll tell you, I have two nephews who are now 12 and 15, but when they were as young as five and eight, I started telling them about my alcoholism. I talked to my sister. I said, do I have your permission to tell them about my problems with it? And she said, oh yeah, you have my permission. In fact, this is a great way to start. So my precious nephews, my babies have known since they were really young that Aunt Laurie had a problem. So mm -hmm. I think it's important for parents to talk to their kids early. It is 
never too early, don't you think? I completely agree. Uh, since I remember when my eldest son was maybe four or five, and again, age appropriate, just mom sober, and they're like, okay. And um, I remember he did a po- he, he said, "Mom, I'm gonna do a poster," and he he put on it like, "Don't drink, it's bad." He said, "Mom, I'm gonna do more of these and put them around the town." So oh, people know. put them around so, your town. I love it. So yeah, we've we've had very natural and normal conversations about it, and you know, like we a couple of now they're a bit older. We've watched, there's been like a show and there's been, you know, maybe someone in the show has been drunk or whatever. And and they've said, um, you know, is that what happens when you drink? You know, just the other day, my husband, my son, they've got all the bugs from going back to school and he was throwing up all day. Uh. And I said to him, this is what I used to be like when I drank alcohol. I used to throw up all day. And he looked at me and was like, why would anyone do that? <laughs> So yeah, Indeed. we have these conversations. <laughs> and you just touched on it. Why would anyone do that? It's yeah. a disease. And yeah. it's very confounding. And indeed, you know, you and I are allergic to alcohol, right? Uh, you know, there are millions of us who can say we're allergic to it. When we drink, we get really sick. Now, if we ate strawberries and got that sick, we'd never eat strawberries again. Such is the insidious nature of our disease, because even though the alcohol makes us sick, even if we're not physically vomiting, we're really sick. And yet we keep doing it. So, and I, I I like how you illustrated to your, your sons that this is what mommy used to, (laughs) this is what mommy used to go through. Oh God. One of the things I talk about a lot, because I believe, and this is why I'm so interested in what you're doing is, um, I believe the prevention part as a parent is that the biggest thing is, is helping them by role modeling and coaching them to deal with difficult feelings and emotions. So that is a conversation we have a lot that people, people are behaving that way because they're frightened or people are behaving that way because of X, Y, and Z. And, and we've, you know, that's what I've started talking about is when he said, well, why would you do that? And I said, well, a lot of the time people are drinking to make themselves feel better. They don't feel good about themselves there's a sort of empty feeling inside and and for a few a couple of hours it makes them feel a bit better and forget that so my biggest thing is is education educating and coaching them to deal with difficult feelings because I didn't get any of that and alcohol was the answer you know that's brilliant when we get sober we finally learn to feel our feelings for the first time in a long time you know this this calls to mind a conversation you and I had about a month ago when we were catching up and we were booking this interview on your podcast and you said kids need to learn how to become emotionally literate. Mm. I thought that was brilliant. I don't think I'd ever heard that term before. And so it's not about fixing your child, which a lot of parents want it. They want to swoop in. Oh my gosh, my kid's on drugs. Let me come in. We're going to deal with this, especially the dads, the men tend to come in and say, we're going to fix this right now, which we know that's not how recovery Mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. So rather than parents today do want to come in and fix their kids, it's more about having these conversations about, boy, you are really struggling here. We want to help you. We want to help you feel the feelings, but we are not trying to fix you. And that is not what we do at uh, recoveryeducation.com at all. We provide education, we provide support and we provide community so that you as parents can make the best decisions possible. But I think, as you mentioned in that previous conversation, you said it's a fatal error that parents do. They, and I actually wrote it down. You said parents are rescuing their kids from tough situations. And I think that's a fatal error. And I would agree with you. And, and I know that I do it, but I try and be very aware of, um, not doing it. And I think that the worst thing that we're doing, and I see it amongst my peers, and again, I'm I'm also saying I'm I'm do it as well, is rescuing them from struggling and rescuing them from having difficult feelings. Because th- that is the bit, if you don't learn that life skill at 10, 13, 18, what the hell happens when you're 25 and on your own or 30, well, right? And you start drinking. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. I, I realize mm-hmm. that's a that's a quick answer yeah. and a little bit of a sarcastic answer. But w- when kids you look do- for outside fixes to your inside problem. That's it. And 
recovery is an inside job. Those of us mm-hmm. who've been in recovery, who've attended 12 step meetings, who sort of are familiar with the language, you know, we hear that a lot. It's an inside job, but it is. And I think we've got to teach kids that change starts from within. It is within you. And guess what, honey? You've got the power to do this on your own. You you don't need these external things that you think are going to make you feel better. But I promise you, honey, it is only in the short term. It is not a long term fix. Yeah. Um, one of the things you said that I also think is massively lacking, because honestly, Laurie, I've had I've had a lot. I used to work a lot with young people and I still support parents. And um, I'm like. Alanon, like I don't know where they send them. One of the things you said is community. Yeah. And how important that is. Well, community is everything. Think about if your child was diagnosed with cancer or if one of your sons broke his leg skiing. I know you guys ski a lot. Let's say that they broke their leg. You would have people helping, right? You would have the Mm. doctor, you would have the physical therapist. Yeah. Um, You would have people. You would have friends saying, hey, can I bring over a casserole tonight? Now I'm dating myself. I'm so old that I know what casseroles are. But anyway, (laughs) um, and I'm from the South. Everything's a casserole. But, you know, you'd have, (laughs) if you, here's a little tip. If you put mayonnaise and Ritz crackers on anything, it's a casserole, just so you know. Um, (laughs) I didn't. So I'm glad you told me. (laughs) But at any rate, you'd have people saying, what can we do to help while Johnny's leg is broken or, oh my goodness, your son's or your daughter's been diagnosed with cancer. What can we do? You need community no matter what you're going through. Same with parents and families. And that's one of the things we're so proud of at recovery.com, recoveryeducation.com rather, is that we provide that community. So not only do we have live events, we're it's kind of like a cable news network right now. We've got live programming every day where parents can watch and listen to one of our 14 medical doctors and therapists who are on our platform Um, every day. They come on and they talk about an issue that's on our platform, whether it's prevention or identifying the disease or how do you talk to your kid? When do you talk to them? How does it impact the family? Should my kid go to rehab? What are the insurance issues? What are the legal issues? We talk about all that and it gives parents a chance not only to connect directly and ask live questions of a doctor, you know, who they might pay $500 to try to get an appointment with. We're providing our parents with that. And we're also providing a way for them to communicate directly with each other so that they can ask each other questions, say, oh my gosh, we are in the thick of it right now. We don't know what to do. We've just sent our daughter to rehab. Has anyone, is anyone else going through this right now? And we give them a, a way to directly communicate with each other because it takes a village. It takes a community. You have to be connected if you're going to help each other, right? Yeah. And, and what you said is so true is, you know, if you have a kid who, you know, God forbid has cancer, whatever, your, your community typically will rally around you. But there's so much stigma and and parents feel so alone. Like, you know, what I hear a lot is, you know, everyone else, their peers, they're all going off for college. They're all checking all the boxes, but their kid, their kid isn't. And parents just feel very isolated and alone with this because of the stigma. They are so isolated. They are so alone. I'm glad you brought that up. Stigma is something that, you know, you and I try to combat by being public, by mm-hmm. talking about our disease, by talking about our solution, which is sobriety, continuous sobriety. And unfortunately, stigma still very much exists. And something that prevents a lot of parents from asking for help is that stigma, that shame. What will the neighbors think? What will my friends think? What will the school think? We're going to be shunned in society. And that's simply not true. So we try to chip away at that stigma, just as you and I do by talking about it publicly. But on our platform, recoveryeducation.com, we talk so much about how stigma has no place in this and that you should not feel ashamed of your child. You didn't cause this. You're not a bad parent. You will deal with it a moment at a time together as a family. You have a community. We're giving you one right here on this platform. And by the way, when you confide in your good friends, they'll support you no matter what. And chances are your friends might be going through the same thing and they're also keeping it a secret. And 
as we know, Veronica, secrets don't help. Secrets hurt. You know, mm. secrets contribute to um, so much bad stuff in our society. And as we learned with the AIDS movement 40 years ago, silence equals death. I think the same thing is true in our community. When parents stay silent, there's less of a chance that their kid is going to get the help they need. Yeah. And I don't, whenever I give a, a, a speech, one of the things I always say is everyone in the room knows somebody. And that's the truth. Everybody knows somebody, that's whether it's a it. colleague or a family member. It's not, you know, you are, it, it, the chances of you being the only family in your town, village, hamlet, wherever you are, is practically zero. I love that you said hamlet. That's so easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, and you're right. It is, I argue, and I have been saying this for 15 years, addiction affects every family yes. in one way or another. Maybe it's not yeah. your nuclear family. Um, maybe it's not your child, but it might be an uncle or an aunt. It might be mm -hmm. your priest or your rabbi. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it might be the pizza delivery guy. It, it might be your best friend who hasn't been telling you. It, it could be anyone. It affects mm -hmm. every family. And mm -hmm. too many of our precious young people, our biggest our, our future, our kids are our future yeah. and we have to protect yeah. them and yeah. we have to help them. And too many of our beautiful young people are dropping dead because of stigma and because of shame and because they don't want to tell anybody. So they go to a party, they drink, they take a pill. They may not make it home that night because yeah. they feel isolated or ashamed and they feel like they can't confide in anybody and it's a really dangerous thing yeah i um live in a very small place it's like eight thousand people and this was before i arrived but just before we moved here um i think it was about maybe four years ago uh there was a, a young man who overdosed and died and it's a you know the high school's like a couple of hundred people you know it happens everywhere and it, it, it parents so badly need this support. I, I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. I love this. I love it. We need this so badly. What is your, like, what's your vision? Where do you want to see recovery education in two years, five years? You know, our vision is to continue to expand and really we want to help as many families as we can. So right now we're encouraging people to join recoveryeducation.com. We are also looking to partner with healthcare companies, with insurance companies, with rehabilitation facilities all over the country who may want to offer our curriculum and our support system to their clients. So um, we, are, we are very close to working with a couple of rehabs in Colorado that target young people meaning let's say between the ages of 15 and 25. And they love our curriculum so much that they're going to be offering it to parents while their child is in the facility recovering. And so we see this as an organic, um, ever-growing effort. And we're not just going to be talking about substance use disorder, which, which we just launched this year. Next year, we're going to be doing eating disorders, hopefully. Yeah. And then after that, we'll be tackling gambling and gaming because that is an enormous yeah. issue. So really, we think it's important to talk about many different stigmatized illnesses, not mm -hmm. just substance use disorder. So that's where we, we see things moving. But really, it's just getting families to recognize there's a problem, not run from the problem, not stay silent, but say, okay, I need help. And then us at Real, we're mm -hmm. going to provide you that help one step at a time in a few different ways so that you can mm -hmm. begin to address this. And, mm -hmm. you know, I feel so lucky to be part of this colossal effort that, that I'm in, that you're in, that we're all in trying to support our kids and our families. It has to be all about families. It isn't just the person in recovery. It's the entire family. Because the whole family is affected. And, you know, it when families access this kind of support and it is the education, the questions that you have, it's endless. It's It, it increases the chance of success of your loved one. If, you know, I, I'm actually working with a family right now who um, have a daughter who's in, I don't know, maybe had 
12th treatment attempt. She's in her 30s. And, you know, the first thing that I did with them was teach them how to have boundaries. And because they were flailing around with that. And, and, it, and all of them have said it's made such a difference just being able to have better boundaries and not run and save and run and help and do all the things that actually are kind of not supporting her. And, and the result of that is for the first time ever, she got herself into rehab. Previously, that was all done for her. Someone, a family member did it all, paid for it. She contacted her insurance. She contacted. And, and that actually, that's what makes the difference. Oh my gosh. You just hit the nail on the head. When, when you do it for you, it's going to work. Probably yeah. there's a much greater percentage of it working yeah. when you're doing it yeah. for you. Yeah. So the fact that this young woman after 12 tries and rehabs gets it on the 13th try because she did it herself wonderful. And I'm glad you brought up boundaries. We have an entire module dedicated to the tools that families can use to effectively address the substance use disorder. Boundaries is number one, right? It, boundaries don't have to be, it's, they're not laws. It's not punishment. Yeah. It's just saying, yeah. okay, here's what we as parents will accept. Here's yeah. what we do not accept. And, and let's make yeah. sure that you are crystal clear on where we stand on things. Yeah. And the other thing that's very important is parental alignment. Parent, mm. Parents being on the same page. Yeah. Mom and dad or dad and dad, mom and mom, whatever your family looks like. Both partners have to be on the same page when it comes to, first of all, figuring out if your child has a problem and then, okay, what do we yeah. do? I yeah. am sure that you see in your practice, parents, partners, not aligned. And it doesn't work if the kid is getting different messages. So we at recoveryeducation.com provide ways to start a conversation, not only with your child, but with your spouse or partner, or maybe you're divorced. It doesn't matter. Whoever the parenting partner is, we provide ways that you can begin to have these difficult conversations with each other and with your child. You have to get on the same page if this is going to work. Yeah, I 100% agree. And that's often the first thing is you'll have one parent who thinks that this is a like a moral failing or about willpower. And then you'll get another parent who's a bit more empathetic and, and getting people on the same page is a huge, huge step forward. Yeah. You know, so often one parent, it is usually the dad or the male partner I found in my experience and the doctors mm -hmm. on our, who are on, featured on our platform often say it is yeah. the dad who says, mm -hmm. you know what? It's just a phase. I smoked pot, honey, you smoked pot. We tried a little cocaine. We drink now, you know, we're hypocrites. If we talk to our kid and it's a phase, unfortunately it's not a phase because there is no phase. If your kid takes a drink that has fentanyl in it, or if your kid goes to a party, takes a pill, hey, this is going to help you have a good time, and they, they go home from the party in a body bag, there's no phase. It's over. Yeah. So yeah. it's really important for parents to take this seriously. Yeah. So um, recoveryeducation.com is where everybody can uh, find out about uh, this platform and everything they're doing. Yeah. Um, where are you on social media if people want to follow you, Lori? I am everywhere. Uh, you can... <laughs> <laughs> so you can find me on Instagram at Laurie Dew. You can find me on LinkedIn, Laurie Dew, L-A-U-R-I-E-D-H-U-E. -E. Um, my Twitter account, unfortunately, was hacked. So I'm Ooh. trying to get that back up. It, but it, that's real Laurie Dew. I'm on Facebook. Please reach out to me. You can also send me an email at Laurie at recoveryeducation.com. I am open to anyone and everyone reaching out. If you need help, let any of us help you. Well, wonderful. I, I'm really, really, really excited about what you're doing. Um, Thank you. I will be promoting it everywhere I can. And I think uh, we can definitely continue this conversation down the road as the platform develops because um, I, I think there's a massive hole and I think that you're filling it really well and we just need to get the word out there. So Thank you. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to get the word out there. Because again, it's going to take all of us. <laughs> if we're going to do something about this crisis with our extraordinary young people, we have to do it together. So thank you so much for the opportunity to come on and talk with you today. You're welcome. Thank you, Laurie. And thank you for everybody who's listening. Please, when you see uh, the post go up on Instagram, if you have questions or thoughts, 
reach out to me. We'd love to know what you think of this episode. And I will be back next week.